Um, thank you all for joining this virtual tour of Upon Closer Inspection today. My name is Chantal Paul and I am the Galleries and Exhibitions Coordinator for the School of Art and Design. This event is made possible by support from the School of Art and Design and the College of Professional Studies and Fine Arts at San Diego State University. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and thank the Kumeyaay people. They have continued their stewardship of land across our region and the land that SDSU was built upon. I'm joined today by Delphine Fuwundu, Fung Huynh, and Claire Warden. They are joining from the traditional homelands of the Tongva people of Los Angeles, the Gila River and Akching communities in Arizona, and the Lenape people of New York. We honor and thank these communities. Our program today features an exhibition tour, followed by a conversation between myself and our three artists, and a Q&A with you, the audience. A quick reminder that as part of our webinar format, the audience is muted and we cannot see you. The chat is currently open. We will pause that during the exhibition tour, but we will bring it back afterward. For the Q&A portion of the event, we will be selecting questions from the Q&A feature. This is located at the bottom of your screen. Please type your, your questions there at any point and we'll answer them later on. Now, I'd like to share a little bit about each of the artists to start our program. Delphine Fawundu is a Brooklyn-based artist. She received her MFA from Columbia University School of the Arts. Her work has been included in exhibitions internationally and can be found in collections of the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Brazil, and the Norton Museum of Art, among others. Fawundu is also co-publisher and founder of MFAN, Women Photographers of the African Diaspora, an organization promoting the works of women photographers. Delphine's use of photography, video, and assembled works explore the connections between her American upbringing, her Mendy heritage of Sierra Leone, and the expanded African diaspora. Fawundu often appears as the protagonist in her works, centered around a narrative that invokes spiritual and ceremonial aspects of her culture, while at the same time interrogating personal and untold histories as reminders of the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. Fung Nguyen is a Los Angeles artist and educator. She received her BFA from Art Center College of Design and her MFA from New York University. In 2019, she was named as a cultural trailblazer for the city of Los Angeles. And this year she received a city of Los Angeles individual artist fellowship. Her work has been widely exhibited and is held in many collections, including the Vincent Price Art Museum. Fung Nguyen's works share insight into the nuances of assimilation and the trauma of migration inspired by her family's resettlement as Vietnam War refugees. Through drawing, painting and embroidery, Wynne examines cultural perception, agency, and the representation of her Southeast Asian heritage. And Claire Warden is a Phoenix-based artist. She received her BFA from Arizona State University, Herberger Institute of Design and the Arts. Her work has been included in exhibitions internationally and can be found in the collections of the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art and the Center for Photography Woodstock, where she was an artist in residence in 2016. Claire pushes the medium of photography to its boundaries, both physically and conceptually through her ongoing series, Mimesis, challenging our perception of the medium. In this work, Claire directly addresses notions of identity and hierarchy, exploring her personal reactions and responses to social interactions and questions aimed at understanding her own ethnic heritage. I'm very excited to welcome these artists and to start this exhibition tour. We'll begin with Delphine. Welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here and share with you um, my work. In this exhibit, I'm sharing um, portions of a larger series called The Sacred Star of Isis. And I'm thinking about um, my heritage from Sierra Leone and the interactions with my um, grandmother, Adama, who I'm also named after, and her tradition of batiking. And I like to use that as an entry point to think about identity 
in the process of making the batik fabrics, layering colors, stamping, patterns, and I think about our individual identities and the transformation, um, you know, transformation pre-colonization, post-colonialization, and the impact that in, um, slavery had on identities in the, in, the, in the African diaspora. So my work is always in communication with Africa and its diaspora. So if we go over to the Passageway series. In this series, um, I often use materials that were made by my grandmother. Right now I'm wearing, in this um, portrait, I'm the one in the purple and white dress, which was hand dyed by my grandmother, once worn by my mother, and then passed on to me. So that lineage, like I'm always thinking about the ancestral lineage, um, even on in a spiritual sense, and we could go to the next one. I think about, um, I'm here with my mom, and I think about the idea in this passageway series, the, the stories that are told and passed on either through historical knowledge and thinking about inter the interrogations of history, but also the stories that are passed on, the oral traditions that are passed on from the ancestors down to, um, you know, to the descendants, but then also those stories and the, um, the ways of being that are passed on from that, that survived slavery and that survived colonialism that we could see in the gestures. And so I think about all of these different things through pattern making, um, through the water, you see water in my um, works often. And we can move on to the next one, to the, to the video, well, to this, this is fine. Like uh, I think about water often. Um, I'm always using materials such as cotton, hair. And these, these materials also uh, make me think about memory and the collective subconscious. So um, hair, the braiding, and you know, I'm really, really interested in this idea of powerful storytelling and that despite of things such as colonialism and the this, this um, transatlantic slave trade that we still live and we still evolve and we're still here. And I'm constantly making these beings inspired by water deities like Mami Wata or Yemaya. And we're gonna go to the video. This video is called um, Deep Inside I'm Blue. It's, a, it's just a meditation, med a blue meditation. And blue is something that shows up in my work unintentionally, but it has significant meanings when I think about the water deities. And it's amazing how when I've looked over um, the last three years of making work, even intuitively, how the blue continues to show up. Here I am in front of the Atlantic Ocean on the side of Lagos, Nigeria, in this blue meditation. And again, also always thinking about masking. We could go on to the next. This one was taken in Argentina, and um, this is this um, photo is particularly important when we talk about the histories that are covered that needs to be uncovered. So Argentina is a place that's known to um, systematically deny its African roots and heritage, and this photo was taken embodying, you know, a deity, an African deity in Buenos Aires in a dress that is um, known to Argentines, but kind of claiming spaces, claiming spaces and claiming the embodiment of being here and the power of being who you are from within. And we could go on. Finally, um, we'll see some more of my works that constantly layering um, with fabrics, patterns, some scanned in, overlaid on bodies, to, because I like to sample different elements, put them together to create a new language. So I think of these pieces as ways to create new languages. And I'm thinking of that, and we could go to the final two. I think of this, um, this remaking of languages, creating languages as a way of imagining the worlds that we want to live in and making new language to communicate, thinking outside of an impressive, uh, uh, oppressive ontology and tapping into ontologies that I feel empowered within and thinking how about how to evolve beyond that. And that's it.
Thank you, Delphine, for sharing your work. It's such an honor to share space with you and Claire in this exhibition. I'm very, very inspired by the work. Um, like Delphine, my, my work um, honors our matriarchs and you know my grandparents, my mom, my grandmother. Uh, this is part of a series I call Resistance Matriarchs. And it was inspired by the last administration and trying to connect my community and social activism with my work. Prior to that, um, I kind of separated my community activism from my art and art was more of a cultural critique. And then thinking about how I resettled here with my family and how I am perceived in cultural assimilation, I wanted to imbue the sense of um, resistance and resilience and giving power back you know, to, to women and particularly Asian female bodies. Can we go to the next one, please? This one is called the uh, Resistance Matriarch. And my friend found this painting and it looked like a typical maybe Thomas Kincaid painting, gilded and this romantic landscape. And in this spirit of reclaiming, I wanted to paint a strong matriarch. And this image comes from research I've been doing about Chinese feet binding and found all these photographs of women in China who had their feet bound. And they were photographed by Western photographers, mainly from America and from Europe during the late 19th century. Um, and in these photographs, the women seem very silent and posed and I wanted to give them back their power. So this gesture is really, really important in the image of this matriarch as I paint her. And then from those paintings, I started to really think about my family's experience. Um, I am of Chinese and Cambodian descent, born in Vietnam. So my, families are, my family are refugees. And when we came to the United States and started to become American, quote unquote, we would go to different you know, amusement parks and shops and I would never find my name in these reproduced keychains or, or anything like that. And I had the choice to change my name, but I consciously decided not to. This is the name that I was given. And even though it's un-Anglicized, I felt it was important to, to keep my name. So these are a series of cross-stitched license plates that I did of various people in my community who didn't change their name. And I feel like there's a lot of power behind that. Um, and I wanted to make it clear that it's, it's California because we can't paint in broad strokes what assimilation and becoming American looks like. Um, for me as a Vietnamese refugee in California, it's very different than, you know, say somebody in Indiana or in Florida. So this is my mom's name. And this is my good friend's name, Chef T. His birth name is Kosal. In addition to these cross-stitch license plates, I did a series of drawings on pink donut boxes. And for those of you who are unaware of the history, up to 90% of donut shops in California are actually owned by Cambodian refugees and immigrants. Um, and so I wanted to honor that and honor like these silent things that we don't even notice. And so on these pink donut boxes, I would draw people from my community who are Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees. And this is my father. Um, the portrait was drawn from his mugshot at a Thai refugee camp. We can go into the next one. So with each of these portraits, I interview the person. I also want them to have agency over what kind of portrait I'm doing. So I would ask them for a photograph where I take this photograph. This is Chef T. He's a Cambodian um, refugee. Um, he's currently a chef, but uh, was raised in an underserved neighborhood where there are a lot of violence and, and gangs, but you know, turned his life around. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. So what I hope to do in this, this series is show, you know, the diversity and com complicated identities of Southeast Asian refugees, how we're not all the same and all our stories are very different. And you would see even in the way that I draw them and their gaze, I'm really trying to capture who they are and the stories behind their experiences. This particular portrait is, is one that is meaningful to me. It's Van Nath, and he um, is an artist in Cambodia and survived Pol Pot's genocide. And the reason why he survived was because he was an artist and he was made to make sculptures of Pol Pot. And he was only 14 of 14,000 people who were killed at a death camp. 
And this is Meili Tao, um, the donut princess. A lot of immigrants and refugees who come here, parents want their children to do better, to go to college and not work, you know, no manual labor such as donut shops. Meili Tao ended up going to UC San Diego, but instead of pursuing her career in journalism, she went back to her parents' donut shop and rebranded it. Um, so there's a whole generation of new folks like that, you know, reclaiming and, and reviving their parents' legacy. And I thought that was beautiful. And this is my mother. She was only 23 when she had me. So I was one and a half when we came to the United States as refugees. Um, and I just can't imagine being a young mother at that age, leaving your country and, and coming here and starting over. So I wanted to honor her in the series. And lastly, I wanted to do a portrait of Mr. Rogers. My family and I um, learned English by watching his show and Sesame Street. Um, and I love what he says, won't you be my neighbor? And I feel like that's a very important phrase, especially the last few years with the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment. But this idea of who's your neighbor and, and, and who is in your community, you know, who's included and who's not. So I love that um, about him. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, SDSU Art Galleries. I was so excited to work with Chantelle on this um, exhibition. As, she, as soon as she told me about it, um, I was just so thrilled about the um, topic that we would be able to discuss. Um, in our work and it's such an honor to be on these walls, these virtual walls with Delphine and Fung. So thank you very much. Um, so um, this is my work. This is a series called Mimesis. In 2013, I discovered a camera, a unique cameraless process, which uses saliva on black and white negative film as a sort of etching process. At the end of that process, um, it leaves behind only metallic silver and biologic matter. My ongoing series, Mimesis, evolved out of these early experiments on film at a time when I was simultaneously thinking about um, the boundaries of photography, uh, what could be photography's edge, and um, my experiences as a person of color in the United States. One thing that couldn't escape my mind and was really prevalent at the time that I started making this work was the question, what are you? And that's a question that um, I first heard after moving to the United States. And as a French speaker, I grew up in Montreal. Um, as a French speaker, translating this question, I was convinced of my own translation error. I could not comprehend what this question, what are you? Uh, was actually asking. Um, over time, I began to understand this question as what is your ethnic background? And um, when I would respond that my father was born in India, that seemed to satisfy the asker of the question. Um, as I grew older and I started learning more about my family history, my father was born in India, but his mother was born in Pakistan before Pakistan was a country. Um, and my grandfather was born in Sri, uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka. And my mother has a long English heritage. So having a short one sentence response to the question, what are you? Uh, did not feel satisfying any longer. So over time, I started to test my answer, like I am Canadian or I'm a naturalized American. And inevitably the next question would, or statement would be, oh, you don't look Canadian. Uh, so it became very clear, clear to me uh, that this question has to do specifically with why I look the way that I do. So, um, this is actually a great piece to uh, hang on, linger on for a minute. Um, so another, and this question, where are you, has kind of um, permeated my life since moving to the United States, but has these different manifestations. And one of these manifestations 
um, is when usually I identify myself as part Indian or my father being born in India, uh, especially in the Southwest, I sometimes can hear the response, oh, dot not feather. And that's the title of this piece. Um, and that phrase is in reference to this idea of Indian, East Indian, and um, this term Indian referring to Native American or First Nations. Um, of course, this phrase um, is an incomprehensible generalization of two very complex and diverse cultures, um, because of course, not all Indians are Hindus um, and not all First Nations um, use uh, feathers as uh, cer ceremonial uh, objects. So um, <laughs> we can we can move on to the next one. Thank you. Um, so each photograph uh, is inspired by either personal experiences, um, these social interactions that I've personally experienced, collective experiences or ideas, or sociological ideas. Um, one thing that I really love about making this work as photographic work is that, um, and we can linger on this one a little bit longer too, is the question that I often hear when people see this work for the first time in a gallery, knowing that it's photographic is, what am I looking at? And this is a really um, nice question in a way because photography lends itself so well to clear representation. And uh, when that representation isn't clear any longer, there's this desire to know what we're looking at. Um, and this piece actually um, ties in kind of nicely. The, the story behind this piece, um, I was actually um, at a makeup counter. This was a few years ago. And the woman doing my makeup um, stopped for a moment, looked me directly in the eyes, and asked me if I was Indian or part Indian. And this was in Arizona. So uh, usually if someone was just going to guess off the cuff what my ethnic heritage was, it's usually not Indian. Um, so I was kind of taken aback and said, well, yeah, my father was born in India. How did you know? And she said, oh, well, I have a friend who's Indian and she has dark circles under her eyes, just like you. Let's just cover those up. And um, so needless to say, that was the last time I ever wore under eye brightener. Um, and it brought up these uh, simultaneous issues of, um, you know, the one thing that was identifiable about my features as part of my ethnic heritage was not in line with her ideal of beauty, but also, you know, what is makeup used for and who is making it and um, does it fit everybody. Um, so that piece was actually created to in, um, kind of use mark making to emphasize a dark circle rather than to kind of um, change anything about the piece. And on that note, I'll talk a little bit more about the process. So um, this is an interesting piece just because it, I kind of break my own rules. But um, of course, some of you might notice that these um, look like they have some mark making in them, which they do. So after the first process is complete of using saliva, uh, there is a secondary mark making process, which I kind of view as more a sociological process. So the first process is more about biology. The second process is more culturally um, informed. And so, um, most of the pieces I work on as negatives, and then I scan the negatives and um, print the positive image. This piece kind of breaks that rule a little bit, um, which I think you, anytime you create a rule for yourself, you should find a way to break it. But, um, <laughs> So um, like I mentioned, that a lot of these are inspired by personal stories. Some of these are collective ideas and like this piece, Double Consciousness, this is a fairly well known um, term coined by W.B.E. Du Bois. Uh, 
this, I remember the first time I heard this term double consciousness when I was reading his um, seminal book, The Souls of Black Folk. I felt as if I could put a word to a feeling I had felt for a very long time. This idea of having a secondary awareness of how I might be perceived. And that awareness really comes from a, an accumulation of experiences of being seen. Um, so over time, knowing that um, somebody can ask me what I am because of my ethnic heritage. Um, in this piece, I wanted to specifically visualize this idea as a triptych. So these are three negatives um, as part of um, kind of representing two forms or two worlds or two entities that are divided across three spaces. So not only taking this idea of double consciousness, but also applying it to the experience of um, being multi-ethnic and being part of simultaneously my mother and my father's cultures, but also um, kind of not really being part of either. Um, so that centerpiece is and kind of that representation. Thank you all so much. Um, so at this point, I am going to stop our screen share and it will be a conversation um, between the four of us. And we will also um, open the chat back up for attendees. So, okay. So thank you all so much for um, taking us through the exhibition and um, bringing us into your minds a little bit as you create this artwork. Um, to go a little bit deeper into some of the themes that we were touched on during the tour, um, you know, Delphine and Fung, both of you mentioned your family's history working with um, textile and maybe you could go a little bit further into how that um, had a role in, in the aesthetic or the process of the final pieces that were created. Just a little mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Yeah, um, for me, the my, my grandmother's fabrics is are the one things that connected, it's the one thing that connected me to her while I was younger in Sierra Leone. Because I was so far away, like I didn't, you know, in Sierra Leone is definitely far, I wasn't like I was able to go back often. And the thing um, that I always had with me were these fabrics, whether she sent them through someone or my mom had them as part of her clothing, but it was something that I knew that her hands touched and made. And as I started um, about three or four years ago, when I started working on the series, A Sacred Star of Isis, I was really just, meditating on her presence and um, as I was thinking about Mende culture and what I started to do was scan the fabrics in and I realized that when I scanned the fabrics in and printed them out they had this tactile feel so it almost was like this illusion between whether you, you you couldn't tell whether the paper was fabric or not and people always wanted to touch it and it made me think about this idea of identity and how you know at, we could look at at someone and think we know who they are and we could just automatically place them into a box without really knowing. So I use the fabrics in that way um, to think about identity, also to think about the layering of identity. And yes, yeah, definitely something that I'm thinking about, thinking about identity when I'm using these fabrics. So it's, it's more so of a symbol and, res and a respect for the heritage. Well, Delphine, I really connect to that too, especially with my grandmother, because that's how I was introduced to art. You know, art for me wasn't my fam, my parents taking me to the art museum or gallery. It was my grandmother sewing little buttons or repairing a uh, ripped clothing. And she was the one who taught me how to embroider or cross stitch, crochet and knit. And I always think how funny it was for like a four or five little year old little girl, you know, <laughs> knitting next to her grandmother and translating soap operas on TV, <laughs> you know, with my grandma. So for me, um, I have really good memories about that, you know, and how textiles and like you said, Delphine, touching something physical that was making art. 
And the other thing is um, I'm a garment factory kid, you know, women's labor uh, was something that helped my family survive. So my mom sold clothes and eventually, you know, had a few machines and then eventually a factory and she would take me to work, but would never teach me to sew. So I'd be four or five years old and I would hide under her machine and wait for her to leave. And I'd take a scrap of material and sew, you know? So those were my early memories of art making connected to my, my grandmother and my mom. And then when I became trained, quote unquote, as an artist, it was like drawing and painting, right? Sculpture and photography. And then more recently, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to go back to what art felt like to me. And so that's why I started, you know, doing those cross stitchings. It's interesting, um, Fong, that you mentioned the, the, your grandmother you, using the fabric, you know, working with fabrics to support her family and my grandmother did the same thing. She sent all three of her children to university through her hand um, dyeing techniques and you know batiking. Um, even when her her prints are known in the town that she is from. If someone saw a dress, they'll be that's Adama's dress. They'll know it off the back. And I just think it's so amazing, like how they were entrepreneurs and thinking about you know supporting themselves through their art through their artistry. And now we're doing it too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so amazing to hear um, hear those connections. Um, it's it's just such a wonderful wonderful way to have a, a an extended family relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and Claire, with with your process, you did not start out in photography working the way that you work now. How did you kind of arrive? You know, I I, I know you explained a little bit about how you started Mimesis. But um, how has this kind of more um, dissection of photography and experimental approach, how has that informed where you are now and what, what you even consider a photograph? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, when I was an undergrad, I was making work. Um, I didn't really fully understand at the time that was I'm kind of trying to find my place in the landscape. Um, So I would kind of incorporate myself into the landscape in these kind of subtle ways. And um, that led to another, and and that was in camera. Um, So I was working with a camera then. And then uh, that kind of led to another series where I was starting to think a little bit more about um, colonialism, preserving things, documenting things, um, botanical illustrations. That was a really common way, especially for um, European colonialists to understand these new places that they were about to colonize. Um, and uh, thinking about um, about uh, ideas related to that. And in these previous bodies of work, I was, as I, as they came to a close, I felt like, you know, I had these issues that I wanted to talk about. And these other works, these bodies of work were kind of like dancing around whatever the, the body of the, the, the issue, right? And so I wanted to dive deeper into like, really what is this experience that I've had um, in, these, in this place in the United States? Um, and it kind of just worked out in this really unique way where um, at simultaneously, I I kind of mentioned this, but simultaneously I was really thinking about the boundaries of photography and how far could I push a photograph? And at what point is somebody gonna say, well, is this a painting or is this a drawing or is this printmaking? Uh, Which is really fun about mimesis that, you know, I've had different, you know, people say, well, this isn't a photograph, this is a print because it's an inkjet print. And so, you know, you're not even using a camera. (laughs) The final product is ink-based. So, um, you know, however somebody wants to interpret that, I still view it as a photograph, but but that's kind of getting to that point where I was like, okay, well, this is really pushing the edge of photography, but it's also uniquely qualified to address some of these really personal questions about ethnicity and the experience of a person of color in the United States, because it literally is using my biology, my DNA embedded into each negative. 
Um, so uh, over time and with the addition of mark making, I started viewing this work more as portraiture than as just, you know, abstract art. Um, um, <laughs> so I guess awesome. I to answer that question is uh, my view of photography is extremely flexible. <laughs> and I, I think that's kind of where the medium is now, which is also, you know, Delphine is working with photography and Fung, you've sort of keyed into photography with the way that you took inspiration from 19th century um, photographs. So it's, it's um, really incredible to see how that medium has kind of exploded into being incorporated in so many different ways. Um, and, you know, Claire, you touched on this a little bit in your answer to this question, but, you know, for all of you, I think the, um, the, the reality of colonialization and how the West has, you know, fetishized um, Eastern cultures and, and um, just so many different countries can each of you um, speak to how that has really influenced your work? And Delphine mentioned it um, as a, a major tenant in the work during her tour. So if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, when we look at the history of the medium, it's been used as a colonial tool. So it's important to um, for me to even show my show a, a figure like show a figure how I want the figure to be in the world. You know, especially a figure a black woman's body or African woman's body and be able to have the agency to say, this is what it is, you know? So it's kind of, you're taking that colonial tool and flipping it and making it into what it is that you want. And, and even breaking the boundaries of the tool in itself, because for, um, for many, and, and, and then thinking about, again, that identity and how the identity is what I say it is. It's not what you, you know, it's not, it's, it's <laughs> you understand having that type of agency as well, because, um, even with some of the photos, I, I, I connect with you, Claire, even though some of mine are, are more direct, but they're scans, they're late. Like, you don't know what I took with the camera and what I didn't take with the camera. And it's all in there. And it, and it, and it really speaks to who we are as people, like multi, multicultural people. And it's, it's to the point where we have to be able to appreciate that in a person rather than placing these preconceived notions on constricted identities. And I feel like that's what I'm doing, um, using the camera and breaking the rules, which um, I say the rules are made to be broken as well, and yeah. making, those, making those images that you want to see in the world. Yeah, I love that about all our works is this decol decolonial process is lifelong and on so many different levels and in so many different ways. Um, so for me, decolonizing is language, like I'm constantly decolonizing the way I use language, names, as I mentioned before, and um, particularly for Delphine and myself as parents, yeah. you know, how we're raising our children and honoring our ancestors. Um, you know, it's very complicated and how it's a lifelong work, you know, lifelong work. Um, but for me, uh, particularly speaking of Vietnam as an experience, that colonial process was over a thousand years. You know, Vietnam was colonized by China for a thousand years and then the French and then the Americans with the war. And you see the evolution of language. Like, I don't even know what it looks like. What does, you know, the original, I guess, uh, Vietnamese language looks like? Because now it's anglicized. It uses the alphabet with accents. Before that, it was Chinese. I don't know what it looked like before. Um, so I love this idea of, of not just hearing language, but what does it look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um... What Delphine brought up about we many of us do have this multicultural, um, you know, heritage at this point, um, and and being able to accept kind of a more uh, multifaceted view of people as opposed to it's kind of like their narrow pigeonholing of of people, um, and that's something that I really consider a lot about my work, but also like what Fung said about language is also a really important part of my work because a lot of this 
a lot of this work kind of originates with a conversation, either a conversation I've had with um, somebody who uh, understands this kind of like cultural experience, or if, um, you know, these kind of more, um, what I kind of consider to be more aggressive approaches to uh, understanding somebody's uh, ethnic heritage of asking like, what are you? Or um, these, uh, var var variations of of what are you like where's your family from or are you you know where are you from or uh, these kind of variations on the this the topic but I think the way that we speak about ourselves and others is really a, to echo Fung is a very important um, part of this decolonizing and de kind of centralizing from, um, you know, um, you know, the, uh, decentralizing this otherness of people who don't identify as Anglo or Anglo-American. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that you both brought up the idea of language because I totally think that that's what we're all doing is making new languages. And I think that evolution, you know, when we think about how we evolve, we evolve by continuing to create new new languages um, so we could have different ways of seeing and being in this world, you know? Um, I also kind of want to touch on this language portion because that connects really directly also to W.E.B. Du Bois and the words that he used to describe double consciousness. Um, you know, that was published over a hundred years ago and I, I want to just ask, you know, I'll, I'll read the quote from him, but also ask, how does this essay still relate today in a contemporary society when we're going to revisit these words? Um, and he described double consciousness as the sense of always looking at one's self through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity one feels his two-ness. And you know, does, how does that um, still speak to you? I know that each of you have mentioned your own you know, connection to that particular phrase. I'm so glad that it was brought up and I, I really admire Claire for you know, taking it head on. It's something that I always have to think about how I view myself and how others view me. I don't have a choice in that. I don't think any of us here, Delphine and Claire, have any choice. We, our identities are politicized whether we want to or not. Because um, going back to what Claire said about decentralizing whiteness, you know, we don't have a choice until that becomes decentered. Then we, you know, then we, we don't have to um, think about this stuff of consciousness all the time, but it's all over our works constantly. And then on top of that, I don't know, Delphine and Claire, how, how you feel about this, but then when we go back to say our place of origin, our ancestors' or, origin, original place, then they don't see us as part of their community, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like Delphine, if you go back to Sierra Leone or Claire, if you go back to either Canada or to, you know, Pakistan or India. But you're not, you know, so we're in between, right? So how does, and that plays more into this idea of double consciousness for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, I've become more and more aware of that. I'm glad you brought that up, Fung, because definitely when I go to Sierra Leone, I'm American, period. You're American, period, yeah. you know? And then when I'm here, you know, it's, it's so interesting that just being in between, but I think it's a sweet spot. Because, because I know who I am, and I think that's what it really has to do with, because there's one thing about the way the world sees you, but the more that you build up who you are and become aware and you define this is who I am, regardless of how the world sees me, then I think that you're able to be able to communicate a little more. <laughs> you understand? You're able to kind of live a little bit more freely. And it's really interesting um, for me, even understanding and listening and um, even trying to see that perspective of what it means to actually live in Sierra Leone or Ghana, because I travel throughout the continent because I want to and I want to learn more and to even being those spaces and then to be here and be in these spaces or when I'm traveling to Europe and just to kind of get an idea of what a worldview can be and um, what it does, it really informs me for my mission, which is to kind of have us break the chains, you know what I mean? I'm really interested in breaking the chains. And to this point, 
I, I refuse to accept that by my very being, I become a political object. No way. Like the hair that grows out of my hair is this is what happens if you didn't under, you understand what I mean? At some point I have to claim that. And if you have a problem with politicizing me, then you need to go and figure out how to decolonize your mind, you know? And because, because I feel like sometimes the burden gets placed on us to do all of that work. And I need to do it for me and my children. That's already enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the people who I'm, who I'm, you know, as a teacher, I taught in public schools for many years. And that was really my job. Like, I feel, I feel a responsibility to do that. But when a society that is built on this historical, you know, oppression, I cannot imbi- I don't have, I don't have that weight to, to carry oppression. I just don't, you know? All I have to do <laughs> is figure out how to get this decolonization process starting with me and to do it in the work and in any opportunity that I have to teach those who will listen to do it in that way. You know, who's along for the ride with me. <laughs> but yeah. there's a fine line between accepting, you know, and internalizing. That's the, I think that's what it is. The, my question of the, of the moment is how can you liberate yourself within a space that just is fixated on oppressing your body, you know, and that tension, but I refuse. I know my being, I'm not on this earth to fight oppression every single day and every breath of my life It's too much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think you guys are both absolutely right. I think, you know, kind of the first experiences with, with this are, you know, like what Fung said, we don't have a choice because we are being observed uh, outside of ourselves, right? And this is the moment where you're like, oh, um, you know, my, like I mentioned, my mother is English or my father is, um, you know, Middle Eastern and Indian. And um, when I was with my mother as a child, um, people would ask me where my mother was then I might be right next to her, you know? Um, so the, the, these accumulation of experiences where you are like, okay, well, I don't apparently look like my mother. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, but the, this idea of taking that, um, the collection of experiences, understanding, you know, who gets asked these questions, why, right? Um, because in my work, when we have these discussions, there are, are some people who have never heard this question. What are, what are you? They're totally shocked. This is a question that exists. And, um, you know, so the next step is to kind of understand, or for, like for me, it, and through my work is to kind of understand how I want to answer questions or what, an, what questions I want to answer and um, what questions that I feel comfortable uh, explaining why that's not an appropriate question. <laughs> Or, um, you know, um, but I think Delphine is totally right too. In, in the same breath, there is a lot of dialogue and discussion and conversation that can happen, especially with the stories that um, inspire each piece in my work. But um, at a point, you know, it's, it's not, we're not only here to answer people's questions. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm also an educator. So that's, you know, part of my nature is to, you know, have these dialogues and be open to discussion and um, kind of explain these experiences. But, you know, there is this kind of uh, moment where you're like, okay, well, that is good for now. <laughs> um, I have to focus on myself and how I see myself and not how I'm constantly being seen throughout my life and how I can, you know, understand my own identity without these external forces that's why i love how delphine put it decolonize your mind so when i'm exactly. tired I'm about that person, you do it I, i'm i'm <laughs> doing it yeah um, but i also love claire how you mentioned that story about you standing next to your mom and how this arises depending on who you're next to right because my kids are um, mexican chinese cambodian vietnamese um, and eastern european jewish so when i'm with them i'm the nanny <laughs> right mm -hmm. I'm not their mom so I thought that was interesting yeah I had this, a similar experience with um my children when they were younger just and just because of skin complexion it's like oh like is that yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of amazing what 
people feel comfortable asking people when you're in a public space Mm -hmm. um it's almost like well you're in a public space so I can ask you very personal questions about your biology and your children's biology or your parents you know genetics or ethnic heritage it's um for people who haven't had that experience it might be completely shocking to know that like your space can be so invaded um when you are you know doing something you know quietly in a public space or we you know on on your own and um it can can be quite um intrusive um so thank you for sharing all of that this has been such an incredible conversation um we could move over to the q a we've got some really great questions that have come in that I think will kind of continue this. Um, we have one question who is asking Fung, is there a tie or a connection between Cambodian culture and donuts? Um, this person found it interesting how the majority of donut shops are owned by people of Cambodian descent in Los Angeles. That's a great question. And, um, you know, when you resettle somewhere, the first thing you want to do is find people who look like you and are like you, right? So an analogy could be like San Miguel Allende. It's a town in Mexico where there are a lot of expats. So all Americans are like together, right? Um, So the same thing when Cambodians resettle, they're trying to find other Cambodians to support each other because they don't have the language, they don't have the culture. So the story is a man named a man named Ted Moy, who's known as the Donut King, arrived as a Cambodian refugee in 1975 in La Habra. Um, he worked at a church during the day, and at night he worked at a gas station. And at the gas station, his coworker gave him a donut, and he he never had a donut. And he's like, "Oh God, this is good. I love this." And he brought it home, and everybody loved it. And he's like, "I want this." And so he thought, "I'm going to save my money and buy a donut shop." And he tried and, and he made an offer at this little like Christie's Donuts. And they said, no, um, but you know, you could work at Winchell's. So he um, entered this manager program at Winchell's to learn the business and he bought his own donut shop. And then he bought another one. And what he would do is as Cambodians were coming to resettle, he would give them jobs and lease you know, uh, donut shops. And he at one point owned like 200 donut shops. Right, uh, and this is like up and down California. My brother has a donut shop in Houston, um, but it's this ecosystem of community supporting each other, you know? Um, and so that's why there's so many uh, donut shops owned by Cambodians. Amazing. That's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, a question from Morgan for Claire um, that relates to your experience at the makeup counter. Um, she's asking, did you not experience this outside of the United States, Um, that kind of interaction? That's a great question. Um, So I was pretty young um, and, uh, you know, I've thought about this a lot, actually, and I distinctly remember being asked, what are you the very first time I heard it in the United States? And I can't say that I maybe I was too young or I just don't remember hearing this question when I lived in Montreal. Um, and I, I, part of the reason that it's just like so emblazoned in my mind is because as a French speaker, I, my English, my grasp on English was not very good when we moved to the United States. And I was actually really trying to translate it in some, find some way that it made sense <laughs> as, as a translation. So, um, you know, uh, I, I have lived in California, in Los Angeles, actually, and I, I've lived in Texas. Um, I've visited, you know, lots of states across the country. Um, I have gone to when we could travel frequently. I frequented New York. Um, and for a, a, a time, um, you know, people were like, well, you know, you do live in Arizona, so it could be an Arizona thing. Um, <laughs> but you know it really man- this question manifests across the country 
uh, one way or another, even in, you know, metropolitan cities like Los Angeles or New York. Um, you know, I've experienced ver variations of this question, um, even uh, in, <laughs> in ways that, um, even in forms that aren't a question like, oh, your look is so exotic, right? Um, so it's, it's this observation of how I look and this idea that I don't fit into a box, right? This pigeonhole. And if you can't fit into this pigeonhole, just this is a natural way that most humans' minds work, I think, um, that we try to categorize things and put it here so we can understand it. Um, but when it comes to humans, we're, if we put humans into a box, then there is this hierarchy, there's a power structure, there's all these assumptions and um, stereotypes and different things that come along with putting people into a box when people don't really fit into this pigeonhole idea. Um, outside of the United States, this, uh, I have actually a friend who is French and we've had some conversations about this idea and uh, she mentioned well you know what if it's just curiosity to know where you're from and um I've especially you know uh when we were talking about you know when we go back to where our families are from um anytime I've gone to India it's like well I'm clearly not Indian <laughs> it definitely didn't grow up in India um and so they're like well you know are, are you American or Canadian or what are you uh, where are you from um um there's different kind of motivations. And I think when it, when I've been in India, they're like, well, you kind of look Indian. So, but you don't, you don't act like you're here or you don't sound like you're from here or whatever it is. Um, you're not wearing the same clothes as me. So where are you from? Right. Um, sometimes uh, I think uh, when I was talking to my friend who's French, this idea of this curiosity, Oh, I'm just curious. Uh, is a, a long established curiosity that some Europeans have um, where it might seem kind of benign at, at, if you're a tourist in a country and somebody asks you where are you from um, but the curiosity it, it has a longer history and it leads directly to colonialism this curiosity so um in a, in a it, to kind of answer that question i'm kind of getting divergent here but <laughs> i i that i think that question persists around the world in some form i think the united states has a very um uh tenuous kind of history with identification um europe has a different history um and I, I, I have experienced it just not the same way as the United States. Um, it's, it's just a different culture of, of understanding people and their heritage here. Um, and that kind of leads into another question in the Q&A from Otto. Um, he's asking if you could share some of your um, opinions about or you know experiences about living in Brooklyn and Los Angeles and how and Phoenix and how that affects your art um, and were these cities your first choice? Um, yeah, and how how that might play into how what is the importance of the city where you live? Well, for me, I was born and raised in Brooklyn and I pretty much live in the same neighborhood that I was born in. So just that alone means a lot to me in terms of how I create. Um, I've watched neighborhood, the neighborhoods that I live in evolve and just that sensibility, it just en enlightens my whole sensibility as an artist. When you think about um, cultures, I live in a place that's com that's really diverse in term, and I grew up in a place that was diverse in terms of, um, you know, from African communities, Caribbean, African American, Jewish, um, Latinx, you know, like there's so many different types of people around here. Um, I also grew up around like I'm two blocks away from the Brooklyn Museum and then there's Prospect Park. So there's something really rich about my neighborhood that I really appreciate. And, um, and I even make work in the neighborhood too. So over the pandemic, Prospect Park was my studio. 
um, for several projects that I was working on. And it and I have a I have a connection. I'm one of those people who connects to space. Even when I travel, there's certain spaces that my spirit connects to that I've never been before, but there's a connection there. And this space, this area is something that I really connect to. So it influence, I can't even tell you exactly how it influences my work because it's spiritual, but um, it definitely, just me being in one place for so many years and watching it grow and evolve, that definitely influences my commitment to um, community and change and all of those different things. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I grew up mostly in Los Angeles. I, I wasn't born here, but grew up in Los Angeles since I was three or four years old. And I think location is very important. So for me, I grew up mostly around Southeast Asian refugees and immigrants and mostly um, uh, Mexican immigrants as well. And being so close to the Southern border, a lot of people are like, you are so Chicana. I'm like, well, that's where I grew up in LA, you know? And my, my sons are Chicano too. So my experience in being an Angelina um, is connected with being not only Asian, but the solidarity with, you know, um, uh, being Latinx too. So, so I feel like I love that about LA and I appreciate that more when I travel or move away. Like there's something so special about um, LA and these like blends of cultures and being so close to the Southern border. It, it's really fantastic for me. And for me, it, it um, helps me build community. And a lot of my work is centered on that experience. Yeah. I feel like I kind of um, addressed some of that question um, previously. I know that, you know, there are certain phrases that seem distinctly Southwest that I've um, experienced, but, um, and, you know, maybe, I, w I mean, I guess I would say, yes, this where I live definitely has influenced my work um, because, the experience of moving from a predominantly French speaking city to a predominantly English speaking and some sometimes Spanish speaking city um, was uh, had a profound effect and how uh, people engage um, with somebody who looks different in in this part of the world um, definitely pr profoundly affected me and led to the work that I'm making now so um, definitely. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, I know the answer to this question, um, but someone asked, uh, if you knew each other before this exhibition mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it's been so nice watching you all. No, but I fell in love with them the first time I saw them. <laughs> right. We're all wearing black. We're all black. <laughs> we, we didn't even plan this. <laughs> It's so amazing how our works are so intertwined with each other. It feels like I've known you all forever, but really this exhibit is what has brought us together. And that's really fascinating. And it's refreshing too, to know that you're not in a bubble by yourself thinking about all of these crazy ideas. Oh my goodness. And, you know, your kin yeah. is in the world somewhere. Yeah. Yep. I just want to share one more thing when Chantel was curating and telling me about you all. You know, at first I'm like, Chantel, this better not be like a multi -culti. Let's have one from each group represented, you know? <laughs> but I'm so grateful to Chantel for introducing us. That is so mm -hmm. intentional. Like I feel very connected to you both on so many levels and we've covered a lot of that today. Yes, for sure. Oh, yeah, the, you. the first time we met over Zoom, it was just, the conversation was so natural and the things that are important for us to discuss in our work were just so connected. So, I, I mean, that has a lot to do with Chantel's um, vision and intuition for this exhibition to see these connections between all three of our work and then bring us together. And it just kind of flows so naturally, which is really wonderful yeah. <laughs> to experience. Yeah. I really hope Thank we get so to meet much. each other in person one day and have I know. <laughs> a show again together and like be there in person. Like that would yes. Be um, there are a couple other kind of quick questions in, in the chat. Um, and I, this is addressed to Claire, but I think it really could apply. It applies to all of you. Um, and it's to Claire, like, do you consider your work a form of self-portraiture? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, so sometimes when I have given um, artist lectures in the past, I will, um, I actually have the quote right here if I can find it. Um, so Robert Giard has this quote that a portrait embodies both our will to know and the limits of our knowledge. Which, um, When I heard that quote uh, for the first time, I thought, you know, this really is a nice way of thinking about portraiture and, and kind of like helped me bridge this gap that I was starting to think about my work like portraiture, but I didn't know, you know, how to articulate it or, um, you know, kind of to kind of validate this, this idea that I had. Um, and I love this idea of the limit of our will to know and the limit of our knowledge. And I think that really has a strong connection with some of the major themes in the work, but absolutely, I think the, the work really feels more like a portrait, a self-portrait than if I were to make a series just photographing my likeness. And, and that's something really intentional that I avoid in this body of work is to not photograph my likeness. That really is at the heart of uh, my experiences is, you know, how I look and what, you know, what I look like. Um, but that was really intentional. And I feel like embedding DNA, but also, you know, mark, leaving my fingerprints and mark making and um, creating different forms that reference experiences or ideas is more about, more about me than just showing you what I look like. That's interesting because I use my likeness, but yet I don't consider it to be, you know, a standard self-portrait. It's more of a, uni a portrait of my universal self. Yeah, which is not, you know, yeah, I definitely think about the bigger picture as I'm using myself to stand in for, yeah. Because for me, I'm thinking about the multitude of this body and how it transforms and shape shifts and becomes so many different things to the point that if you looked at a series of all of my work, half of the times you don't even know who is who and it's all the same person. And I think that that speaks to the, the beauty of identity and the multi-layeredness of identity to the point, I think I was saying this in our personal conversation that someone um, thought that one of the beings was a, they, what they described a review and they were like, oh, um, for one dude takes a portrait of this male figure and I was like yes <laughs> and it's me you know what I mean so yeah so for me it's more of that shape-shifting quality yeah I love that I love that I didn't recognize it was you I didn't think it was male but <laughs> it was a different one yeah a different one <laughs> <I think. laughs> But similar to you both, my work isn't necessarily capturing my likeness or is not strictly autobiographical. It's more self-reflective and mm -hmm. how my work, same with you all, uh, connects with our communities, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this leads into another question um, really nicely. Uh, Elias asks, you know, can anything be considered art? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious how, how you might um, contextualize that. I think not everything can be art, but you can use anything to make art. It's so funny, this week in my um, class, we were looking at performance artists. And so there was this quote by Bruce Nauman where he said, you know, in his rebellion, rebelliousness, where he was like, you know, if you put me in a white space and you, you call it a studio and, it, what, and I'm an artist and I'm in a studio, anything that I make therefore is art. Right. And I, I thought about that for a while and how liberating and freeing that could be for someone who calls themselves an artist. Right. But then I also have this idea that everything in the universal sense is art, is science. You know, I think, you know, and as you start to think about the idea of creation and, you know, so we, we have the, the, um, the standard art you know, gallery and art as a commodity, and then what we could define as art in that way. But I think that things that don't make it into the gallery is definitely art, like the way that my mom cooks. I think that that is a art, <laughs> trust me. You know what I mean? So I think that as individuals, whether you call yourself an artist or not, there's something, this beauty that comes from the universal creation that allows us to actually create something that never existed before. And to me, that, that's art. So in that sense, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah, this also reminds me of a quote that um, I heard Kara Walker 
mentioned that, you know, anybody can declare themselves an artist. Um, you don't, it's not something that you need, you don't need a degree to be an artist. You could wake up one day and say, you know, today I am an artist from now on. <laughs> this is kind of, is not the same as, uh, you know, a career path of like a doctor or a dentist or something like that. So, um, you know, you can kind of just declare this. And I, I think if you do declare yourself an artist, then what you create is art. Um, and that kind of also is like this very freeing um, moment where, you know, it kind of, the ki kind of the answer is yes, anything can be art um, if you want to call it art. Um, but I also totally agree that, you know, cooking and, um, you know, um, different like everyday objects, there's this art history to things um, that, you know, and science, there is definitely an art to science. Um, and, and maybe vice versa, science to art. But, um, you know, there is a lot of kind of like interconnection of art in our just daily life. And that's kind of a really beautiful way of thinking about things. Even though I do scrutinize my students, my photography students, I'm like, don't come oh. in here just snapping that camera away. It's not gonna work, no. <laughs> it has oh, to absolutely. something to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, the teacher, the educator side is a little harsher on that. Exactly. <laughs> the answer to that question. But, but that, that's only in this, you know, stage of growing yes, um, yes. and, and technical <laughs> competence. And um, um, once that is out of the way, then yes, anything can be art. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so this is actually, I was, thinking to ask this question in um, the pre, you know, before we got to the audience and it, it just, you know, it didn't flow right. So, but this is perfect. It's a little early on the West coast. It's only 1230 about, but I'm going to ask you if you could have dinner or drinks with any two artists, historical or contemporary, who would they be? Oh my God. <laughs> that was your trick question that you had. Oh. <laughs> it's a fun I one. It now. <laughs> oh. It's a fun way to end. <laughs> you know what? It would be for me, Artemisia Gentileschi, the Baroque Italian painter. I'm like, can I please just paint the headed men too? And how do you do? Like, I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> how do you fight the patriarchy? Like, you fought the patriarchy, you know, back then. So. Yeah, that's great. Oh man, that's a tough question. This is the moment where all of my history evaporates from my mind. Exactly, right? <laughs> well, maybe maybe I can leave it for, for you to keep thinking about throughout the day. <laughs> you know, we can maybe leave it there. Um, I, I know I would but, love, yeah, I I mean, wanna... this person's not a visual artist, but um, somebody that I've been really inspired by, there's actually been a few people that I've been really inspired by, um, like Intozaki Shange, a writer. And I would love to just sit, because I've been using a lot of her work in my, her words in my, um, in my work. I'm really, really attracted to the literary form and words. And so her words are so powerful and they've been resonating. Her and Octavia Butler. If I could have like a sit down with those two, that, that I, I, would, I would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Can I go to your dinner party, Delphine? Sure, <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> oh, that's great. Claire, you want to think about it throughout the day? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I just, there's so many, there's just so many that I can't decide. I mean, that's the first awesome. person that came into my mind because I just, love photo history would be uh to sit down maybe with William Henry Fox Talbot at the moment that he found out that somebody else was uh making photographs and just see how much he was panicking about that um but also you know um I have uh I I door I have Dormar book in the back here and Sally Mann and um you know uh <laughs> Maybe Julia Margaret Cameron, she's a pretty interesting figure at uh, kind of um, 
dismissing the comments of the patriarchy in her time. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so many. Yeah. Yeah, it's so great. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for um, sharing so much of yourselves and your art with us today. It was just such a really inspiring and incredible experience, um, even to be in, in my role as, um, you know, kind of putting this event together with you. So I hope um, all of our attendees and the audience has really enjoyed themselves. And yeah, if you have anything else you want to add, but... Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I mean, yeah, this was so awesome. I'm just thank you. Know. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share space with these brilliant artists and you for this vision and the audience for coming out. Yeah, this is really great. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to sign off and end the webinar. Um, okay. <laughs> so hopefully, I'll continue to see you guys a little bit longer. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.